Hello and welcome to MK's Exam Secrets, Season 2, Episode 1. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we'll look at five exam questions in one clinical course. Please stay tuned and watch this video till the end because there is a bonus giveaway that we shall be giving away on the YouTube channel. So drop a like, drop a comment. If you haven't yet subscribed, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell notification icon while you add it to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Grab a piece of paper, grab your pen, and let's go. So beginning with our question one, a 56 year old man presents to the emergency department due to worsening shock, shortness of breath and cough. Her symptoms began yesterday after peritoneal dialysis. She denies any productive cough, fevers or chills. Medical history is significant for end stage renal disease secondary to poorly controlled diabetes mellitus requiring peritoneal dialysis. Physical examination is notable for a woman with increased work of breathing, decreased breath sounds over the right lobe, and stony downness on percussion. What is your diagnosis? List possible causes of their diagnosis. Categorize the causes. How much fluid does the normal pleural space contain? How much fluid should be accumulated in the pleural space for it to show on a chest x-ray? What is the recommended limit in a single thoracosynthesis procedure? Why should only moderate amounts of pleural fluids be removed at a time? And the last question is name the criteria used to distinguish between pleural fluid exudates and transudates. So you may pause the video right now before I give you the answer. I will give you five seconds to pause the video or read through the question. And here comes the answer. So background of the question. So this is a woman that has end stage kidney disease. So it means that her kidneys are failing. And in addition to this, she also has poorly controlled DM. Uh, and she also has these features of respiratory distress. So she has increased work of breathing. She has decreased breath sounds over the right lobe. And of course, stony downness on percussion over the... Um, um, right uh, aspect. So most likely there is a pathology that's affecting the right lobe uh, or the right side of the lung. And because this woman is having this difficulty in in um, breathing, she's also having this stony downness to percussion, there is some fluid that has accumulated in the pleural space. So this is obviously a right-sided pleural effusion secondary to chronic kidney disease in a known diabetic patient. Then possible causes, you may divide them largely into two main groups. They are what I refer to as transudative causes or transudates and exudative causes. Remember the main difference is that with the transudates, you get a fluid that has a high concentration of proteins. Uh, uh, I mean, low concentration of proteins, low concentration of cells. And an exudate is one that has a high concentration of proteins, high concentration of cells. So causes of transudates include any condition that can lead to a hypoproteinemia, things like liver cirrhosis, nephrotic syndrome. You may also have other conditions such as congestive heart failure, constrict, co constrictive pericarditis, mixed edema that's associated with hypothyroidism, and MAKE syndrome, which is a condition where a, a patient has an ovarian tumor, right-sided pleural effusion, as well as uh, ascites. Then they may also have an exudate that may be due to TB, a paranemonic effusion, esophageal rupture, pulmonary embolism, a systemic lupus erythematosus, pancreatitis, uremic pleural effusions, and even rheumatoid pleural effusions. And then normally in the pleural space, you have roughly about 10 to 20 mils with an average of about, of about 15 mils of pleural fluid. That's about 0 0.3 mils per kg. Then how, uh, how much fluid needs to be present for it to show on the x-ray? So if you are doing a PHS x-ray, then you need about 250 to about 600 mils for it to show significantly on the x-ray. Then on the lateral, which is much more sensitive, you need even just as little as 50 mils that are present. You can pick it up on the lateral x-ray. Then you shouldn't drain more than 1 to 1.5 liters. And the reason why you don't want to exceed this amount is because you want to prevent what is referred to as re-expansion pulmonary edema. It is and a complication that develops when a collapsed lung is allowed to expand. And the criteria that is used to actually distinguish between exudates and transudates is known as the rights criteria. Here, the details of the rights criteria. So, you predominantly divide these pleural um, effusions into transudates or exudates depending on the following things. So, you compare the ratio of the 
plural to serum uh, proteins. If it's less than 0.5, then you refer to that as a transferrate. If it's greater than 0.5, it's a net straight. And then the ratio also of the plural lactobiodrogenase over the plural over the serum that can be hydrogenase. If it's less than 0.6, then it's a transudate. If it's greater than 0.6, then it is an exudate. You can also compare it, it in such a way such that if the plural LDH is less than two-thirds of the upper limit of the serum LDH, then you refer to that as a transudate. Or if the plural LDH is greater than two-thirds of the upper limits of the serum LDH, you refer to that as an exudate. These are the causes of uh, transudates causes of exudates that I mentioned earlier on. And in some cases where you're not able to do LDH, you may actually do total proteins. So if the total protein in the effusion is greater than uh, 30 uh, grams per liter, then it's often an exudate. If it's less than 30 grams per liter, then it's often uh, a transudate. Moving on to question two, a 35-year-old presents to the emergency department due to abdominal pain, malaise. He also reports yellowing of his skin. Medical history is non-contributory. Social history is notable for intravenous drug use and having multiple sexual partners. Physical examination is remarkable for right upper quadrant tenderness, generalized jaundice, and scleral icterus. Laboratory studies demonstrate the presence of HBS antigen and significantly elevated IgM anti-HBC and... HBE antigens. What is the most likely diagnosis? What are the risk factors associated with this condition? How is it transmitted? Months later, the following results were obtained from the same patient, hepatitis B surface antigen positive, hepatitis B surface IgG negative, hepatitis B core antigen uh, positive, hepatitis B a core uh, IgG positive, hepatitis B E antigen uh, positive, hepatitis B E uh, antibody IgG positive for each of the above state. Uh, what it implies, list possible complications of your diagnosis in A and what other serological tests will you do? So I will give you five seconds to pause the video and scream the answers at your screen. And if you are enjoying these videos, please drop a like and watch the video to the end. There is a bonus question at the end and there is a bonus giveaway as we approach 1,000 subscribers, which these winners of these um, competitions will be announced when an individual or when we reach the 1,000 subscribers threshold on the channel. So please make sure that you are subscribed. Make sure that you do like the videos. You do watch the videos till the end for you to be eligible to enter into the competition. And here comes the answer. So this is a patient that has, of course, yellowing of the eyes, yellowing of the skin, and some risk factors for contraction of a viral disease. Then, in addition to this, we've checked for some important surface markers for uh, hepatitis, and we've found that they are positive. So this patient has acute hepatitis B. So before we actually go into this, let me just show you a black screen so that I can explain everything, and then we'll come back to the questions so that it's very easy. So let's say you have our hepatitis virus here. Okay, you have the nucleic, nucleic material that is present here. Remember that the, the hepatitis uh, nucleic material is almost circular and it's DNA. So let's say you have this uh, nucleic um, material here that is present in the core of this um, virus. So this is going to be surrounded by a nucleocapsid. So this is obviously a nucleocapsid over here. And then this is going to be surrounded by these surface um proteins or an envelope there's going to be an envelope as well and there are going to be surface proteins that are going to be present okay so you have this here 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 okay so this is the surface so the surface of this hepatitis virus has these receptors which we're going to be calling our hepatitis b surface receptor okay so you can call these as surface antigens. They're present on the surface here, okay? Hepatitis B surface antigen. Then on the core of this um, virus, so in the core of this virus, you have what is referred to as the hepatitis a core antigen. And in the envelope, you also have what is referred to as the hepatitis B envelope, envelope antigen. 
Okay, so those are the three main antigens that are present. We can actually check for these antigens. Hepatitis B surface antigen is the one that we usually check for, and it's an indication that you may have hepatitis, depending on the other characteristic things that you may find in the body or the characteristic other tests and the, based on the clinical scenario. So you may find out that an individual has hepatitis or they do not have hepatitis, depending on whether they do have the surface antigen or they don't have the surface antigen. Because the surface antigen is the one that enables the hepatitis B virus to actually gain access to the cells. So remember for each of these uh, antigens, you have antibodies that can form. So for the hepatitis core antigen, there is an antibody that can form. For a hepatitis surface antigen, there's an antibody that can form. For a hepatitis E antigen, there's an antibody that can form. And out of these three antibodies, the one that is protective is known as the antibody against the surface antigen. Those are the only antibodies that are going to be protective to an individual. So it means that if someone gets a hepatitis infection and they create create antibodies uh, against the surface antigen and then you can't even detect any surface antigen in their body but you can detect the antibodies it means that this person is actually protected against hepatitis b but if they have high concentrations of a surface antigen but no antibodies it means that probably they have a viral infection with hepatitis b virus so these antibodies that are made out of two groups you remember that an immune reaction when you react to something for the first time you can, you are going to be producing igm immunoglobulin m and then with subsequent exposure to the same antigen you're going to be producing ig g okay so you're going to be producing igg same thing is happening here so there's there are going to be igm antibodies here as well as there are going to be some IgG antibodies. So remember that the IgM is going to be indicative of an acute infection. The IgG is going to be indicative of a chronic infection. And sometimes if you get both IgM and IgG in the same scenario, it may be an acute on chronic infection. So these antibodies where there's an asterisk are the ones that are going to be protective against hepatitis um, virus. And then the uh, hepatitis Envelope antigen will only be present if a person is infective. If they have high concentrations of antigen and low concentration of antibodies against HBE or the envelope antigen, it means that this person is highly infectious. So the higher the concentration of the envelope antigen in the serum, the higher the infectivity. Then the core uh, antigen is not found in the blood. It's often found on the hepatocytes. So the core antigen is usually indicative of this person probably having the infection. The they have the hepatitis B infection. So in some scenarios, you may find out that there is a balance between the surface antigen and the antibodies that are found uh, for hepatitis B such that if you test for either, you won't be able to find them. This is referred to as the window period. So this window period, that's where we often check for these other antibodies against the core antigen and the envelope antigen that are often positive and may help us make a diagnosis when you can neither detect the hepatitis surface antigen or the hepatitis antibody. So against the surface antigen. So this is like a basic schematic of the antigens and antibodies that are often made. So let's get back to the question. So this is a person that has, of course, IgM antibody against the core antigen, as well as they have these envelope antigen that is present and the surface antigen. So for sure, this patient has a hepatitis uh, virus. So they have an acute hepatitis uh, B. And risk factors include occupational um Factors such as healthcare workers who are exposed to patients that are sick with hepatitis, homosexuals, multiple sexual partners, which this patient actually has, intravenous drug use, or they have given a history of that. If age above 60, this patient is young, chronic liver disease, living in an area that's endemic for hepatitis B. Then how is it transmitted? It could be horizontal transmission through the contact of body fluids, sweat, saliva, uh, and other uh, vaginal as well as penile discharges, blood and blood products. You also have organ transplants, IV drug use, and even share, sharing of contaminated instruments such as needles. It could also be transmitted vertically from mother to child, prenatally, intrapartum, postnatally through breastfeeding. Then months later, you find out that this person has hepatitis B surface antigen positive. So meaning that they still have the hepatitis virus in them. And we find out that the hepatitis B surface uh, immunoglobulin G is negative. So it means that they have not yet formed immunity. This being negative means they are not protected. They haven't formed that long-term immunity against hepatitis B. Then they have a, a co-antigen, which is going to be indicative of them being 
um, the virus actively multiplying or actively replicating in their hepatocytes. You have the presence of this core antigen. Then, of course, the presence of this uh, core IgG means that this has now become a chronic infection. Remember, even though that you are making these IgG antibodies against the core, they are not going to be protective. The only antibodies that are protective are the ones that you make against IgG, um, the surface antigen. Then they have also the B antigen, which is positive, meaning that they are very infectious. Uh, then they also have the um, Ig um, G antibodies uh, against the E uh, antigen. So it means that they are going to uh, have a chronic infection. So they have had a chronic infection. So this acute infection has pretty much progressed to a chronic infection and this person has failed to actually clear out the hepatitis virus. That's what these all, all these results mean. And then possible complications of acute hepatitis include chronic hepatitis, fulminant hepatitis, where someone develops hepatic encephalopathy within eight weeks. You may have cholestasis, chronic liver disease, as well as hepatocellular carcinoma. Other serological tests that you may do include liver enzymes such as AST, ALT. You may also order for other biliary uh, tract enzymes such as alkaline phosphatase. You may do a serum bilirubin as well as a full blood count. Moving on to question three. A 28 year old man presents to emergency department having been unwell for the past week or so. He has been on TB treatment for the past six weeks. He complains of poor appetite and tiredness and is particularly concerned that his eyes have turned yellow. On examination, he has jaundice and a palpable mildly tender liver. His liver function tests are as follows. Bilirubin 185, AST 1610, ALT 1635, ALP 220, GGT 5 50, albumin 38, INR 1.5. Comment on the LFT's results bearing in mind the clinical scenario. What further history are you going to take? What is the most likely cause of the patient's condition? What other causes should you consider? Name four. What signs will you look for in a patient with chronic liver disease? Name six. So I will give you five seconds to think through this question. You may pause the video if you so wish. And here comes the answer. So let's first, let me just give you a background. So listen to this explanation because this is probably going to be the answer for part A. So you get this 28-year-old patient and that's on TB drugs. Remember that the TB drugs are rifampicin, isoniazide, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol. Now, we're assuming that this patient has uncomplicated TB nonetheless. So, or even if they have extrapulmonary uh, TB, they would still be treated with the same drugs, ideally. Remember that rifampicin, isoniazide, especially isoniazide, and pyrazinamide are hepatotoxic drugs. That's the first thing that you need to understand. So this person's um, liver being involved, there is some involvement of the liver, maybe attributed to these TB drugs that they have been taking for the past six weeks. Now, by virtue of you doing this liver function test and realizing that they are deranged, it means that there is some hepatic involvement. The raise in bilirubin, the raise in uh, AST, ALT is going to be indicative that there's going to be hepatic damage. Because remember that these enzymes are found, AST and ALT are found within the liver and they can only be released into the blood when there is some hepatic damage, hepatocyte damage. So there is definitely some hepatocyte damage. But the fact that GGT, which is an enzyme that's found in the biliary tract, is normal would indicate that the problem is not in the biliary tree, but rather the problem is within the liver, as also manifested as having a normal ALP. And us having a normal albumin uh, range, it's even closer to the lower threshold, may indicate that the liver still has maintained some of its function, so it's not totally gone or not totally non-functional, but there is some impairment given with also the increase in the INR time, meaning that there is some significant impairment, especially in the synthesis of the clotting factors. And there is some hepatic damage, obviously, that may be attributed to the treatment of the TB drugs. So the further questions that I'm going to ask on the history are going to be things like the HIV status and if this patient is taking antiretroviral therapy. I'm also going to be asking about the drug history. Are they taking any other drugs, especially drugs like uh, paracetamol or acetaminophen, which 
are known to be hepatotoxic. If they are, they should give you the drug name as well as the dosing. Is there any history of alcohol intake? Because alcohol also does damage the liver. Is there any history of recent travel or malaria? Because complicated malaria may sometimes present to you with such features. You may also look for features of upper GI respiratory tract as well as um, upper respiratory tract um, symptoms which may include uh, or indicate infections some other viral infections you may sometimes get an individual having an upper respiratory tract infection or a GIT infection that progresses and extends to the liver then what is the most likely cause of the patient's condition? Obviously, this is a drug-induced hepatitis, most often caused by the TB drugs. If I was to guess one of them, I would guess isoniazide. Then what other causes should you consider? So you should consider alcoholic-induced hepatitis. So it could be due to alcohol. It could also be due to viral hepatitis. It could be due to gastrointestinal TB because don't forget this patient is actually on TB treatment. And then it would also be due to autoimmune hepatitis. Then what signs would you look for in a patient with chronic liver disease. So coming from head to toe, there may be hepatic encephalopathy, a decrease in the level of consciousness, there may be parotid enlargement, gynecomastia, spider nevi, caput medusae, testicular atrophy, asterexis, finger clubbing, dupe trains contractures, even palmar erythema. There may also be some scratch marks on the skin and these may be pointing you towards chronic liver disease. Just name six of them and you will be home and dry. I named almost all of them from head to toe so that you are able to remember them very well. Sorry about question four. I don't know why the answer is already there. But anyways, let's read through the question. A 46-year-old man presents to the emergency department with sudden onset of dyspnea, pleuritic chest pain, and mild hemoptysis. The patient's medical history and family history were unremarkable. An ECG showed an incomplete right bundle branch block. The patient underwent chest radiography, which revealed a Hampton's hump on the left side of the chest. Blood gas analysis was done and revealed features consistent with type 1 respiratory failure. What is the diagnosis? So obviously you have this type 1 respiratory failure, which is secondary to pulmonary embolism. So this patient has a pulmonary embolism. And the features that you often see on ECG, most commonly you're going to be seeing a sinus tachycardia. You may sometimes see features of right ventricular strain. So you may see T-wave inversion that you may see in leads V1, V2, and V3. You may also see right axis deviation. And rarely, though... This is actually um, stated as the hallmark feature of pulmonary embolism, especially with massive pulmonary embolism. You see what is known as S1Q3T3, where you see a prominent S wave in lead one, a Q wave that's going to be present in lead three, and an inverted T wave that is present in lead three. Then for Hampton's hump and the other signs, I do explain them in depth in the next slide. So just wait on that. And how you distinguish between type one and type two respiratory failure on blood gas analysis. Let me just give you a background. Remember that for a respiration to actually happen effectively, you need a ventilatory system, which is going to be consisting of the muscles of the chest, the airways themselves, and you also need a gaseous exchange apparatus, which is pretty much the alveoli capillary interface. So if there is a problem with the oxygenation uh, or the problem with the gaseous exchange, then you develop what is referred to as type 1 respiratory failure. The problem could be in the alveoli or with the capillaries themselves. If the alveoli are collapsed, they're not going to be bringing enough oxygen. If the capillaries are collapsed or blocked in some way, they're not going to be bringing enough blood to get that oxygen. So in type 1 respiratory failure, there is a failure of oxygenation, meaning that there's going to be some hypoxemia. So if you look at the partial pressures of the gases, you're going to be having a low arterial partial pressure of oxygen, less than 60 millimeters of mercury or 8 kilopascals and a normal uh, or even a low carbon dioxide partial pressure. The normal carbon dioxide partial pressure is 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury, so it may also be less than 35 millimeters of mercury. On the other hand, type 2 respiratory failure is going to be characterized by a failure in ventilation, so there's going to be a problem in the system that actually pushes air in and out. So this is going to be characterized by hypercapnia. So there's going to be a low oxygen partial pressure that's less than 60 millimeters of mercury and a high carbon dioxide partial pressure, which is greater than 50 millimeters of mercury. Then what other tests are indicated and what would you see? So you may do an echocardiograph. You may see vigorous, vigorously contracting left ventricle with a dilated right ventricle. You may also do a CT angiography where you may visualize the site of obstruction. You may see the thrombus and the pulmonary artery. You may do your ESR, which is often elevated. D-dimers are also elevated. 
lactic dehydrogenase may be elevated. And when you do a full blood count, your polymorphonuclear, um, polymorphonuclear um, lymphocytes or leukocytes are going to be uh, leukocytes rather are going to be increased and then how would you treat the patient of course bed rest for the patient abc's check that the airway is patent if there is need for intubation intubate the patient give this patient high flow oxygen unless if they have a chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder but ideally they should have oxygen 60 to 100 percent start them on therapeutic dose low molecular weight heparin for at least five days or until the inr is greater than two and then for uh, at least 24 hours or greater than 24 hours then you can follow this by Wafferin, and if they are hemodynamically unstable, meaning if the systolic blood pressure is less than 90, you may consider thrombolysis without a place. We do not often do this in our setting. And then you also should give some IV fluids, ionotropic drugs, if they are features of right um, ventricular failure or to improve the pumping of the right side. And if all these measures fail in this patient, then of course they may be a candidate for surgical embolectomy if they do remain hemodynamically unstable. Some signs that you may see in pulmonary embolism, remember that Hampton's hump is going to be referring to this dome-shaped or wedge-shaped pleural-based opacification in the lung. That's often due to lung infarction. You may also see Westermark sign, which is regional oligemia of the lung fields. You may see a pallus sign, which is a right descending pulmonary artery enlargement. You may see a flashner sign, which is a central pulmonary artery enlargement. You may also see a knuckle sign, which is an abrupt tapering off of the pulmonary artery. Then question five. I don't know how I keep giving you the answers before the questions. Apologies for that. It will not happen in the next videos. So a, a 45 year old man presents with a complaint of frequent headaches. His blood pressure was 160 over 85, 155 over 90, 162 over 90 on three consecutive clinic visits, despite being initiated on a low salt diet six months earlier. At your recommendation, he is not taking any medication and does not have any other medical problems, you decide to diagnose hypertension and initiate a first-line medication to control his high blood pressure. Number one, how is the diagnosis of hypertension made? So remember that the diagnosis of hypertension can be made in several ways. The first way is this person having a persistent, note that the keyword is persistent, elevated blood pressure of a systolic greater than 140 and a diastolic greater than 90 on two or more separate occasions. And when you actually take the blood pressure on these separate occasions, you should take the blood pressure with the patient's left arm, the right arm and the legs. And also you should take the blood pressure with them seated, laying flat and standing as well. And you should also take some repeated measurements to find an average. The second scenario is actually having a, a features of end organ damage. So you do not necessarily just have to wait for them to come back the other time. If they come back with a very high BP, for example, a systolic blood pressure that's greater than 180 and a diastolic blood pressure that's greater than 120 and features of end organ damage, you may make a, a diagnosis of hypertension there and then. Then the classes of the antihypertensive drugs with their side effects can be uh, actually listed with the ABC mnemonic. So A for AC inhibitors, which may cause mild bradycardia, um, mild a dry uh, cough which is often due to bradykinins that are accumulating and then a also for alpha blockers which cause reflexive tachycardia a for angiotensin 2 receptor antagonists that can be used as alternatives to ace inhibitors to those that develop cough then they may have a side effect of angioneurotic edema as well as renal dysfunction b for beta blockers which may cause bradycardia and bronchospasm c for calcium channel blockers which often cause swelling of the ankles they also have uh problem with headaches d for diuretics with the non-potassium sparing diuretics they have hypokalemia as a side effect then v for vasodilators which may cause reflexive tachycardia and orthostatic hypotension then what the patient was later found to also be diabetic which class of drug will you ensure this patient is on treatment so you would add ace inhibitors which have been known to be good in especially diabetic patients with hypertension. Then fundoscopy is an essential part of examination of any hypertensive patient, outlining the possible abnormalities graded according to Keith and Wagner classification. So this is a classification of hypertensive retinopathy, which I give on the next slide. Define malignant hypertension. This is simply a systolic blood pressure greater than 180, a diastolic greater than 120, and often associated with end organ damage, specifically with hypertensive retinopathy, showing papilloedema. 
See, this was previously referred to as hypertensive emergency. Then what are the two most common causes of death in hypertensive patients? So cerebro cerebrovascular disease as well as ischemic heart disease. So this is the grading for hypertensive retinopathy, grade one to grade four. Grade one, you have silver wiring or increased reflectiveness of the vessels so that you have thickening of the arterioles. You um, can also have increase in tortuosity of these vessels. Then grade two, whatever you had in grade one plus atrial venous nipping, which is often produced when the thickened uh, retinal arteries pass over the retinal veins. Then grade three, you have whatever you had in grade two plus cotton wool spots, flames, uh, flame-shaped hemorrhages, as well as soft exudates, which are often due to infarcts. Then grade four, which is what you had in grade three plus papilloedema, you have this blurring of the margins of the optic disc. So this is, is the 1K subs giveaway. So this is a new version of the internal medicine book written by, of course, your one and only Dr. Moses Kazevu. So if you want to actually stand a chance to win this uh, new edition of internal medicine and pretty much enjoy and prepare for your exams, then all you have to do is subscribe to the channel, hit the bell, uh, hit the like button rather, share the link to as many friends as you can and of course drop a comment answering this question below and when we actually do reach a thousand subscribers then we shall announce the winners of the competition and distribute these books and send them to these individual winners as a way of appreciating the support on the channel so here's the question a 56 year old man comes to the outpatient department with the following results hb 18.6 grams per deciliter mcv 79 mchc 34 white blood cell count 98 and platelets 465 what is the diagnosis what symptoms could he have presented with in relation to the diagnosis in a above so just some alternative explanations for this presentation what important points in the clinical examination may be useful in deciding on the likeliest diagnosis suggest three useful additional investigations so please comment in the section below and start a chance for you to win that 1k subs giveaway Thank you for spending your time to listen to this MK's Exam Secrets Season 2. Stay tuned for more content on the channel. If you haven't subscribed, what are you waiting for? Hit the subscribe button. Hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Drop a like. Drop a comment to Zambia and beyond. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.